All right, good afternoon. That's my pleasure to be here uh, and have all you here as well. So I'm going to hopefully try to entertain you to the best of my abilities, uh, not only with uh, just some of my own research and what my own research is all about in regard to folk houses and the folk cultural landscape, but just give you a little bit of tidbits here and there um, on my travels through um, throughout West Africa this last summer and a little bit a little I mean a little bit of the adventurous nature of it and how rewarding that was, you know, as an adventure as well as of course as a uh, as Dr. Ward mentioned as a as a uh, data as a data gathering experience, a field work experience. So as have many of my others been in uh, experiences doing such in the past have been as well, right? So um anyhow this last summer in uh in June my um, my trip was to West Africa, right? To, I went and visited exactly about eight different countries in West Africa. Uh, and most of them where I did focus on exactly uh, what we just mentioned, folk culture, folk, ma folk material culture. And of course in recent years, as, as we well know, in many ways it's like I've told my classes this semester, we're at a turning, in many ways we could say we're at a turning point in human history uh, in, many, in many regards. Um, as we well know, in terms of the, the global economy, we definitely know we're at a turning point. Uh, what, what the future, what, the, what lies ahead in the future may never be what it has been up until now. And from a political point of view, and especially this whole interplay between what we call globalization, this whole concept of globalization, and what it implies economically and culturally, um, and the more traditional or folk cultures of the past. And so especially I'm looking at mostly purely from a cultural point of view, right? <laughs> Looking at the folk material culture, definitely of course as how culture in traditional culture in traditional societies is manifested um, on the landscape, right? The most I focus mainly, of course, we can look at all different types of folk culture. I focus focus on folk material culture, more specifically house types. Why? Because they're they're such an obvious symbol. I mean buildings are in, are in a part are a part of the built of course, are a part of the cultural landscape anywhere in the world that people live. And so I think dwellings, house types, especially in traditional societies, um, being the case that they are in most traditional societies still very common, uh, some more than others, but they're an obvious symbol on the landscape. And they're a symbol of, let's say, as to how well or to, to what extent that folk culture, that traditional culture um, is still intact, right? On the other hand, we have the all too common uh, symbols of popular culture, sort of in opposition to this, most notably what we see here. And that's probably all the images, or two of the three of the images here are really the only, probably about the only two, I guess in many ways on a, bright, on a brighter note, on a fortunate note, are the only couple images that I'm, that I'm gonna really be able to provide you of, uh, of popular culture at least in this case popular culture as manifested as I saw it in Western Africa. So um, at least as I guess as aficionados or um, those who are really interested in folk culture, in the persistence of folk culture, uh, might be quite pleased, probably more than many other regions in the world, uh, having made a trip of this, you know, through this particular part of the world. And so what I want to look at today are the different factors as to basically the research that I'm currently working on here and elsewhere as to what are some of the dif different factors that explain maybe why, or in some cases, why not uh, the, you know, why folk culture has persisted, you know, to a certain extent, why it has, why it hasn't. And overall, I'm kind of looking in West Africa, like from what I was able to tell that I think in many ways it, it did, pers it, it, it continues to persist uh, in spite of this sort of, uh, this force this trend, or even this onslaught, as I call it, um, of, glo of globalization, of global culture and global economy. Um, for better or for worse, it still, con it still continues. So we'll, you know, it's still very prevalent. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about, a little bit why, um, why that is. Of course, here we have, right, kind of the two opposing forces. Uh, I guess you could say the paradox, sort of the typical paradox that we see throughout much of the third world to begin with, in many parts of the third world, traditional culture, folk culture does thrive, as we can see here, especially in terms of dwellings. Um, if for nothing else, on a less fortunate note, out of poverty, right, out of the lack of affordability, lack of being able to afford anything else, 
um, it still continues. But I think in a lot of regions of the world, I think at least hopefully want to think that there's something besides just, I mean, obviously that seems to be the more obvious factor, but I want to think that there's something besides just poverty as well. And now in the modern contemporary world, let's say the, the modern industrialized world, more and more academic scientists are starting to realize not only the beauty of these things, but maybe even what we call the sustainability the, from an ecological point of view of maybe not all, but certain types of uh, traditional dwellings, right? And that's not to say that, you know, that means that that's the way that we all have to go back and appreciate, you know, uh, grass thatch or mud dwellings with a mud floor and that's the way we should all live, or that people who currently live that way shouldn't deserve something better, right? And of course, um, in academics and whatnot, there's all, in, in other parts of the world, the, the, you know, the, uh, I guess there's the all too common complaint or accusation that we here in the first world are doing sort of our fun little, um, our sort of fun esoteric studies of, you know, studying and portraying quaint cultures, the quaintness of these, you know, uh, primitive people, so to speak, rowing around in, you know, flat bottom pirogues and uh, living in little grass thatched hut and oh, how cute that is and whatnot. And, you know, obviously there's, I guess you could say, I mean, understandably, there's a lot of uh, distaste or dislike. There's an attitude of distaste towards this sort of traditional academic approach here in the West, right? So at the same time, it's not, I don't want to go through and portray it, you know, as this is the way it must be or the quaintness of it necessarily. Uh, but at the same time, it has its values. And I think even more so now as more and more people, even in these parts, even in countries like Mali or Senegal or whatnot, definitely realize uh, the quality of preserving folk culture, right? The, I mean, if you go, I mean, every country and locality has its museum where these things are not only portrayed, they're put on display, but I think they're, you know, uh, highly respected, right? And more and more people are realizing, and I think even local people, in my own experience, whether it's in Africa or in Mexico or where else, uh, definitely will admit in many cases to the greater values of comfort of something maybe more like this as opposed to a dwelling that's supposed to look modern and built by some Western aid, as, as Paul Thoreau himself, those of you who are familiar with the travel writings of Paul Thoreau, who wrote the Dark, who wrote the dark Star Safari, he wrote some, some ideas about this, and so did uh, Richard Kapuczynski uh, from Poland, a journalist from Poland about, I think it was Kapuczynski, wrote some like, Germans came into Kenya and built these concrete apartments, what basically would be akin to a housing project, built the concrete Western style uh, housing project, you know, apartments, and what happened after they were built? The people maybe even stubbornly insisted and in remained living in their little mud huts with grass thatch, their little round huts, right, with grass thatched roofs and mud and dirt floor, and used these new apartments for nothing more than storage. They're like, the heck with these stupid things, you know, you know, we're, we're going to stay living in our, you know, what we're familiar with, our comfort, what, what has meaning not only perhaps in terms of maybe in physical comfort, but just cultural values that, that have been in place for so many years. And they couldn't, you know, just the way the extended family, the whole dynamics of the family and the way it's made up. I mean, just the arrangements of the way people live and way, where people keep their animals and everything else wouldn't make sense in a modern Western uh, type of housing situation, you know, type of housing arrangement. It wouldn't be comfortable. So we've definitely seen plenty uh, plenty of examples of this. At the same time, of course, even the countries I visited, um, perhaps as modern urban metropolitan culture does tend to thrive in the big capital cities, there we see something else because we see a whole different class of people. We see a people who have, by and large, been long and probably for several generations or at least more than one generation removed from rural culture. But on the other hand, you know, definitely admittedly do prefer modern suburban type homes because they work in a nine to five Monday through Friday office job. You know, they're either they're a bureaucrat or they're a business person or, so, uh, or, or whatever related to that, right? So that's a little bit different. But just to go through and look at this, um, we here we had the paradox, right? Throughout, well, whether it's in West Africa, to some extent the rest of the third world, your traditional uh, mode of living there on the left, and of course on the right, your so your sort of comic right, uh, typical pop culture right, and I like the way they've lined it up there: the chicken in, the creamy in, and the pizza in, right? <laughs> they all it's it's kind of like here when you go to 
a food court and you've got, which are also owned by the same, you've got Taco Bell, Pizza Hut, and uh, what is it, KFC, I believe it is, all owned by the same large mega uh, transnational corporation. Well, here it's a, it's a much smaller version of that on a smaller scale. Interestingly enough, I did not see a single, not a single American or seemingly American chain or international chain restaurant uh, or any other establishment other than Club Med and maybe a couple other hotels, Holiday Inn, something like that, uh, in all of the eight countries I was in in West Africa. For example, this is, far, this is as close as you got to McDonald's or Pizza Hut, right? The Pizza Inn being not being anything related to the old America Pizza Inn, but you know, uh, basically a chain, if it's, if it's even a chain, it's only as far as through the western part of Africa, right? Some of the major capital cities. No McDonald's, no KFC, no Pizza Hut, no, nothing in the hall. And this, of course, that was taken in the one and only mall, I think one of two malls in Accra, the capital of Ghana. And for that matter, the only one of two malls that I saw in the whole of West Africa. Even the, the, the next largest city of Dakar, Senegal, you know, it's the closest thing to a shopping mall. Because that's, you know, to kind of look at the antithesis of folk culture, you know, obviously I'll go and you know, had some interest in look at how much, you know, look at the modern areas, the modern cities as well. And the closest thing I saw to a shopping mall was, you know, about five stores. I mean, it would put, I mean, any, any, even any mall would put that to shame these days, right? I mean, it was just, it really wasn't, you know, what you'd call a mall today. And this one in Accra was definitely, uh, wasn't even quite as large as Magnolia Mall, just to kind of give an idea of scale. And this is, you know, one of the, I guess, if you will, the most forward or most rapidly economically developing capital cities in West Africa is, is Accra, Ghana. Of course, Club Med rears its head in many corners of the wind, many beaches of the world, and this was actually in a beach which was, at least at this time of the year, or perhaps due to some political events and whatnot in the recent past, the place was quite vacant. The whole beach resort area was vacant, but this is in uh, western Senegal, uh, oh, yeah, on, the, on the coast of Senegal there, uh, which we'll get to here just to, uh, I'll get to the map in a minute. Just want to go over go sort of the, the central theme of uh, what I'm going to basically talk about today, just to look at from a, an academic research point of view. Well, just to, so that way we can, um, well, that's a show you I did some academic work, academic research, apart from travel, <laughs> right, apart from just, you know, um, <laughs> exactly, Club Med the whole time. <laughs> you know, and actually, only that, this is as far as I got to Club Med, was up to the entrance there, and I was turned away the minute, you know, as, as quickly as I got there, I was turned away, you know. I hardly even got a picture in there, but um, anyhow, yeah, maybe two days at the beach, or three days the whole time, the rest of the time I was, you know, looking at folk culture and popular culture, and uh, the, the interplay between these two, uh, between these two forces, if you will. So, first of all, of course, like I said, my own research ever since, well, my dissertation itself was when I was Dr. Ward mentioned on uh, folk houses in northern Mexico. That's how, that's where I got started really into looking at folk houses and folk cultural landscapes. Um, so uh, mainly, of course, for one thing, we look at uh, traditional or vernacular architecture as it's often referred to as as well, si almost, almost um, synonymously, according to physical geography or as we refer to ecotones, right? Um, where the environment, you know, based on climate, you know, environmental regions based on climate and vegetation. Um, so that's largely, I mean, that, that tends to be the more obvious, you know, folk houses vary according to uh, environmental characteristics, right? For, of course, obviously, based on what sort of materials are available and whatnot, you know, according to that type of vegetation that's available, right? And other natural resources. Uh, however, culture, you know, culture and environment are the two things that we look at. Culture, nonetheless, in almost every case is important. Because in many cases, culture does transcend um, environment, you know, I guess, you know, environmental regions or ecotones. You know, culture, whether it's through trade, as well, I'll talk about how, well, whether it's back years ago, in the beginning, the slave trade, or even a uh, few centuries more recently, especially in West Africa, the Saharan trade, the trade across, you know, there were many great empires. We often leave them out in Western history lessons, but the great empires named after present-day countries in Africa, or countries in present-day Africa named after them, empires such as Mali, Ghana, which were always quite coinciding with the modern-day countries of those names, but in that general area, Western Africa, there was a lot of, you know, they were at the center of a trading system between them and the Arab civilizations, and even Europe further to the north, right? Um, so the Saharan trade definitely brought culture across many lines, across many 
environmental regions and um, you know, culture diffused with that, as well as, of course, with the uh, expansion of Islam. Islamic culture expanded, uh, diffused into, well, as we know, throughout much of Africa, it diffused well into sub-Saharan Africa early on, right? As, uh, as much as a, even around 1,000 years ago, right? If not a little bit more. Uh, then, of course, we'll look at more recently, most recently, how, especially in certain regions, modern transport, um, modern transport networks, infrastructure, and modern trade, of course, have brought about even greater influences, and I guess you will definitely have been a greater vehicle for the influence of globalization in certain areas um, and what the effects of globalization have been. So uh, look at really, um, at least where I visited, I really did a, a transect from north to south, essentially, more or less. Um, visiting really, I guess you could say, um, three major regions, three major ecotones. Uh, the Sahel, the Sahara, I really didn't get into the Sahara proper. I was near the southern fringe of it. And unfortunately, due to a number of factors, I actually had the court cut short. Had to, long story short, I had to cut short my trip to Timbuktu, which is in the Sahara proper. But um, going from the, from the Sahel down into the woodland savanna and then into the tropical forest the further south right along the coast, right? And looked at the, how the house types varied from well, the Sahel. And even in the, if you were to go into the Sahara, you'd see basically many of the similar characteristics uh, mud brick, right? Mostly overwhelmingly mud brick, mud brick construction, as we often refer to it as adobe, right, from the Spanish word, uh, for the main resource material. Uh, and when we talk about folk housing and vernacular architecture, we talk about the form, right, the form and the plan, what we call the, ge the geometry of the, of the houses, meaning the form, the overall three dimensional form, the shape. Does it have a pitched roof, a flat roof? Is it round? Is it square? Uh, how is it arranged? How is it you know, laid out as well? And then more specifically, the plan, the two-dimensional plan, or the floor plan. More specifically, what is the arrangement? Is it, how is the house arranged? In a linear fashion, in a circular fashion, you know, around some sort of large open yard, a courtyard, right? Uh, and of other variations of that as well. Um, in the Sahel and the Sahara, this is where we look at a good example of how cultural tr of culture has long transcended boundaries, uh, long transcended environmental boundaries, especially with this, what they refer to as Sudanese style architecture, uh, most notably in the form of um, religious places, right, of mosques uh, with the spread of Islam, right? Simultaneously, the spread of Islam was, of course, the whole Saharan uh, trade complex, right, at the same time. In the, within the last 500, well, within around 1,000 to 500 years ago, right? And, you know, then the first, those first five centuries of the second millennia. And then, of course, then as you go further south in the woodland savanna, interestingly enough, that Sahelian, that Sudanese-style architecture persists, as we'll see, to some extent. The use of mud brick is still present, is still prevalent. Actually, amazingly, I didn't expect to see as much mud brick in areas that were seemingly where you do have a notably wet season there's still quite a bit of use of mud brick. Uh, so I'm wanting to think that culture had the, something to do with that as well, uh, cultural influences over the past few hundred years. Uh, but greater use of wattle and daub, right, as of course wattle and daub expands, right, with the changing between uh, humid and dry, um, right, through the wattle and daub where you have a, a, a basically a pole structure, a frame structure with a mesh of sticks in between and then those, uh, I guess, if you will, laving or stick walls are then plastered over with what we call daub, or essentially mud, right? And then that's sort of more of a, it's uh, more of a plastic. There's, more, there's greater plasticity in this type of building material than with adobe. And uh, so, therefore, we'll supposedly last a little bit longer in humid, a little bit more humid climates. Uh, of course, thatch roofs, a greater prevalence of metal roofing. I'm starting, I think, as I headed south, you do tend to head more toward I guess if we have greater, more modern influence as well because you're further away from the interior and closer to the coast where the bigger cities are. So there's gonna be a gradually greater prevalence of modern industrially mass-produced building materials, most notably uh, corrugated uh, tin roofing material or corrugated zinc, as they call it, right? It's actually what it is. Um, so then of course, the form obviously changes around more, more slanted roofs, right? More rainfall stands the reason there's going to be more slanted, more, more pitched roofs or conical roofs, depending on the shape of the house. Nonetheless, that's interesting enough to still see 
a relative persistence of flat of, of, or popularity along with the, the pitched roof buildings using flat roofs as well. Once again, I think there's something cultural as locals would say that they like, in some ways they like having the, the conical of the pitched roof because the heat can rise, but the flat roof presents a nice terrace where when it gets really hot, you can go up and sleep on the rooftop, uh, which is actually is which I did. When I, was in one, when I visited one particular tribal locality, you know, the option was to sleep on the roof, and uh, you'll see that in a minute. Uh, it was actually quite pleasant. And so it's quite popular for locals as well as travelers throughout that part of the world, and even in, in, the, hotter, in the hot Saharan areas as well, even in the Middle East. The tropical forest, uh, still some mud brick amazingly being used, more wattle and daub. We'll see some examples of wetland construction, right, where there's in swampy environments. And then, of course, what I call ecological or sustainable architecture is becoming an ever more popular, I guess, if we will, sort of subset or subfield of, you know, folk culture and vernacular, or, you know, vernacular architecture and folk housing. Looking at these, as numerous authors have done more and more nowadays, but one, one I forget his, uh, I forget the name of the author, wrote a book called The Barefoot Architect, right? Looking, not saying that you have to go, that it's necessary to go completely back to these old folk styles of construction, but to look at them and use many ideas from uh, traditional folk dwellings as something that are more ecologically sustainable, right, in terms of, you know, using locally available resources as opposed to mass-produced resources that, you know, leave a huge carbon footprint that require loads and loads of fossil fuels just to produce them, right, and to transport them from, uh, from factory to consumer, right? So, um, and then the comfort levels as well, right? And then, of course, then we um, now look at, the, once again, getting toward where you have larger metropolitan areas closer to transportation routes. However, the popularity, the prominence of mass-produced building materials tends to be more common. Uh, that's just a little uh, quick there, showing where my route was. Uh, flew into Senegal, uh, went overland down through the Gambia all the way down to the northern fringe of Guinea-Bissau flew back to, Guinea, to Dakar and then flew from Dakar just to save time across really, at least in terms of human settlement, a vast, I wouldn't say nothingness, but something close to that, very, very sparse human settlement in here. Flew into Bamako and then did a transect there overland, up just shy of Timbuktu, or about a day shy of Tim, day's travel shy of Timbuktu, and then back down through Burkina Faso, and we have one of our colleagues here had I think had quite an experience in Burkina Faso um, for a year on her, on her Fulbright there. So, um, unfortunately, I didn't get to um, get in touch with Dr. Jones, who's with us here today. While I was there, our, um, as I arrived, she was leaving, but the way it worked out. But um, from there, went into Ghana, down through Ghana, and then went over just a little bit in the neighboring countries of Togo and Benin. Um, so just, I mean, just a little bit to kind of start off, you know, just to kind of give you an idea, a little historical background, and just to kind of show the transect of the trip as well. Start off, and of course, uh, Dakar, the capital of Senegal, the little place of, uh, this little island right off the coast of, from Dakar, actually in the bay in between Dakar, kind of comes around like a, uh, like a little peninsula, uh, and curls around, so there's a, providing where there's a bay between that peninsula where Dakar is and the mainland. And right there, of course, is where you have this little island here, Ile, Ile de Gore, which has a strong historical significance. This is really, by and large, where the French, I wouldn't say, but pretty, I mean, of course, there's another town up the coast called St. Louis, actually, or St. Louis, which I think maybe it may have been more important. But nonetheless, by and large, the French began their slave trade here at this particular place in Ile de la Gore. Um, and of course, there you can see the cannons from the old fortifications, the old French fortifications that were there. Um, on a less fortunate note, of course, you know, in terms of, as we well know, the whole dark side of white European influence, and as many say, what really made Africa go downhill from then on out over the last 500 years, of course, was a slave trade and all the European influence thereafter. But this was uh, relatively small, but nonetheless, the, the, the main uh, slave fort there in Dakar, you know, where slaves are traded, where they are transported, where they are held, and then, you know, there's a whole dark moment of how those who survived, you know, were shuffled out onto the ships, on the slave ships that came, that came to the Americas, right? Um, and that's one of the key 
attractions on that island. Of course, the architecture, definitely in terms of vernacular architecture, is mostly all historic, right? Nothing really new or present in terms of vernacular architecture, but kind of reminds you of a lot, a lot of other, I guess, if you will, historic herbs, you know, historic districts um, of, of, you know, especially what we might call colonial uh, trading entrepots around the world, whether it be New Orleans, Savannah, it be Dakar, it be uh, Madras in India, or Goa, right, or Macau, Hong Kong, and so on, uh, presents a good example of just how the, the, uh, the old colonial architecture has lived on, and I guess if you will definitely become sort of a quaint tourist attraction. At the same time, it's definitely not a place that's sanitized, so to speak all perfect and sanitized like Charleston and New Orleans or even a number of cities in Europe or whatnot. I mean, it's definitely, I guess you could say, rough around the edges and kind of like if, you're, if you've ever been to Cuba, right? If you've ever been to Havana, it's still dusty and kind of worn. It has that worn, that old worn out appearance and whatnot. It's just kind of there. People live there. It's, tourism is there, but it's not so dominant that you've got, that you even have to have a McDonald's just to feed the tourists who, who go there, right? In other words, it's, you know, you go there, you uh, immerse yourself into it. Uh, as a matter of fact, that on the right there, that was a little B&B &B that I stayed at in an old colonial house there. So that was quite atmospheric and um, nice, but of course didn't have the amenities of the Holiday Inn, for example. Um, there's your old French colonial house there with the gallery, which is quite common in the tropics, right? The gallery on the front there. Uh, the big baobab tree in the middle. And life in many African uh, settlements revolves around the Boabab trees. Uh, this is where I embarked on my overland journey to conduct field work into the hinterlands. This is basically a, what we could call the closest thing to a typical bus station in many African cities. Even if you've been to Latin America or some different places in Asia, you hadn't seen anything, as they say. You hadn't seen nothing, <laughs> all right? Uh, if you think, you know, in terms of the conditions of, tra of overland travel, um, what I traveled, what everybody travels in, is one, one of these old beat up uh, Peugeot station wagons, right, that they cram, they call them a seven place or a set plus. Sometimes they, they become more like, a, more like a 10 place station <laughs> wagons, right? I remember having to sit, on, having to sit on, on, on a person's lap more than one time or, or somebody on my lap practically going on a, anywhere from a three to a seven hour journey, right, over land. Uh, not to mention the heat factor involved in all that, and of course, no air condition, that's, uh, that's few and far between, right? Uh, I'm not sure what the, why the guy was for rent here, I'm not sure quite what he, <laughs> what he was renting himself out for, but I'm um, not sure if I want to know. But, um, let's see, there of course we have the, uh, the ecotones, right, and you know, the four main, really four or five if you want to include all the way up to the Mediterranean, but the four main from sub-Saharan Africa down to the equator, Sahara, the Sahel, you know, the sort of grassland step environment of the Sahel, right? Uh, the savanna, more of a wooded savanna, gradually becoming more wooded than the, than the tropical forest, right? So as you can see, I did my transect through those, and there they are. Uh, all the places in red are specifically places that I visited to do field work, right? They're either villages or groupings of villages, like the doggone country as a whole area where you have, you know, about, well, a total of something like a couple hundred uh, villages, and then I visited, about, of those I visited at least about, I don't know, seven or eight. Um, and then, so I'm not going to, the way I show you, the, the sequence is not going to be in exactly the way I traveled, but more importantly, it's going to be in the sequence of the, the procession from the northernmost ecotones to the southernmost, right? Uh, so starting off in the Sahel, main Places, feature, places I visited were, of course, the Dogon region, where the Dogon is a tribal people unto themselves, right? Um, definitely kind of one of the more, I guess, popularly portrayed cultures in West Africa, and probably one of the most important tourist attractions, believe it or not, as well these days, despite the, and of course, probably, well, folk culture, for better or worse, in many, in many instances, remains intact because it becomes a major tourist attraction. On a less positive note, some argue that maybe it becomes turned into a commodity, it's a commodity itself, and becomes commodified. Therefore, in turn, further jeopardizing either sooner or later certain values of that, of that culture complex as well, right? I mean, when you've got people, when you have to pay $200 or more to see a masked ceremony, right? Um, they're, they're, I mean, they're doing that all for tourists, right? But what is that doing in turn not only are they putting that on 
for show, for tourists. It's not the real authentic. It's the closest they can do to the authentic, but they're doing it for purposes of making money. But just the fact that they're making more money, what is that in turn going to do to their values, right? All sorts of questions we can ask there. Um, then, of course, other places there. Mopti Janae, of course, is very historically important and tied to, in some ways, you could say if you've been to Janae, you've almost been to Timbuktu, at least in terms of the cultural landscape. Um, and then Segu there further up the river. So all along the Niger, or all along or near the Niger River, which is the lifeblood, just to put it simply, of West Africa. This river here, the Niger, beginning up here in the highlands of Guinea, arcing around and um, coming all the way down, emptying into where you have the Niger Delta in the country of Nigeria there. So uh, definitely historically an important river for trade, transport, um, and for every other aspect of livelihood. Uh, matter of fact, I did my whole diet in Africa on fish from start to end, right? Believe it or not, I've rarely, uh, rarely even needed to eat any other form of meat. Fish was almost always, except for in the Dogon country, right? Because there's really no major water source nearby. I ate fish, whether it was ocean, whether it was saltwater fish or freshwater fish from the Niger River itself. Uh, Livelihood definitely, well, even in, the, in the, uh, the main city of Mopti, which is not a village or a town, but a small city and the most important sort of provincial capital in that part of Mali. Um, and, you know, they have modern amenities like banks and ATM machines and, you know, maybe one or two nice hotels, restaurants. Uh, no Holiday Inn, however, although they showed me where the new, you know, I guess Hilton-like resort was supposed to go in. But... Um, Nonetheless, traditional folk life, if you will, still goes on uh, in all respects, especially when you look at the main, I mean, looking at the Niger River here, the most I saw, I mean, I was even hard up to see a motor, an outboard motor hanging out of the back of one of those. Some of them did, but not very many. Many of them were still rowing or pulling their way up and down the river, uh, going all the way up to Timbuktu. The trade routes, you know, to some extent still, you know, part, they're either fishing or they're trading. Most importantly, um, what they there's, there's the main port there of Mopti, right? That is the, you know, the main, the river port there of Mopti. Uh, not a lot in the terms of what we'd consider really ultra-modern port facilities there. And there's your main, you know, how many big, um, how many big motor boats or even motorized vessels do you see? There's only one which goes up and down the river that carries passengers during the uh, rainy season when the, when the water's higher, right? When the river level's higher. Now the river level's pretty low, but it comes up all the way to where these buildings are when it's high. Um, but there you can see the, the typical mode of transport. Uh, these pirogues, as they call them, French word, which means a flat bottom boat. Right? Of course, the Cajuns in southern Louisiana use what they call a P-Row, basically the same thing, right? A flat bottom dugout uh, boat there. And so, of course, I had my chance to ride one of them, uh, one of those boats as well, on a number of occasions. But this has long historically been the core of trade across the Sahara. And still, to some extent, it's still probably what keeps Timbuktu, if barely alive, Nothing compared to the glory it was a thousand years ago when it was the height of Islamic civilization and the universities, you know, and all the documents that are still kept in those universities in Timbuktu, right, as a cultural center, as an academic center, right, back in that time. But the salt, it's always largely thrived on the existence of the salt trade, and that's what these are, these big slabs of salt that come from somewhere up within the midst of the Sahara. Timbuktu is the main trading center, but they come all the way either up the river as far as, or even further, all the way to uh, Bamako, right? Or down the river from Timbuktu down the other direction toward Nigeria, right? So the salt trade, I guess we can say in many ways, not only what keeps folk culture alive, it has allowed culture to transcend boundaries as well. Um, little village near Mopti, the Bozo, uh, Bo yeah, Bozo tribe as they're known, the Bozo culture. This is one of their villages. Um, flat roof, mud walled adobe, you know, mud walled houses are, are the norm, which are pretty much the norm throughout the Sahara as well, uh, as they are in North Africa and many other parts of the dry world. Um, round dwellings are, are, interestingly enough, still common, in, mainly as, um, I don't think that, that, that was actually um, an actual sleeping quarters, so to speak. And each sleeping quarters has its, you know, you know, we, it, we can get into real complex explanation. Uh, for example, in this case, the thatched dwellings are the ones, are usually the cruder ones where the young couples, either where, you know, young women live, where they sleep, or when a young couple gets married and can't afford to go off and build their own house and be away from mom and dad, they have to stay living in mom and dad's compound just to wreck their little inexpensive 
you know, low mud walled thatched dwelling. Uh, and I believe that's rice that they've got out in front. They're drying their rice that they've cultivated. Um, this is what this is here too. You see somewhat more substantial dwellings in the background. Just these simple rude little uh, thatched temporary huts here where the young couple goes to live, you know, usually at least hopefully temporarily until they can move on and afford something bigger and better. Uh, this is another group of people known as the Poule, as they, as they, the Poule, as they call them locally in French. Uh, basically the Fulani, right, which is a large, which is an expansive culture in much of West Africa. Uh, their village, right, across the river from Mopti there, sail, you get in one of those boats and go across the river. Here's another one. This is my guide. Actually, he's from the Dogon. We'll see more of him in a minute. This is my guide from the Dogon country, uh, Hasimi. Um, there are some more of those dwellings in that same area near Mopti. Um, there you can see the flat roof dwelling next to the somewhat uh, perhaps less or uh, simpler dwelling there with the thatched roof signifying that probably the young married couple lives there. The parents probably live in this one there, right? Uh, and then there's your mud bricks ready for construction, right? Um, the pool are known for their, or the Fulani are known for their distinctive, the men are for the distinctive hat he's got there. They're cattle herders. Uh, this is the Dogon country, just to go through that. That's the, it's all, all the settlement is confined along this escarpment known as the Bandiagata Escarpment. Um, and traditionally, the dwellings would be, of course, there are the big baobab trees again. This, once again, is where the Sahara really becomes the Sahel. Typical Sahelian uh, landscape, the scattered trees, especially the baobab tree. The baobab tree is even sacred to these people. The cliff, the escarpments in the background. Uh, there he is, Hasimi Gindo. He's actually from the village of Ende. Uh, and that's the typical Dogon headwear that he's got on there. And he's showing me uh, some millet that's just been ground. Millet is the staple uh, in this particular area. Uh, the cliff dwelling, of course, is the most traditional form of dwelling. Um, in the cliffs, it kind of reminds you of Mesa Verde and out in the southwest and other cliff dwellings out there. The Ogon is the local spiritual leader or shaman, I guess something closest, more closest atten, akin to the shaman, right? And he's wearing his uh, bubu, as it's called, his, his, uh, his robe, in this case with monkey skulls glued to it. So he hunts monkeys, they're very sacred, right? They're what they call a fetish in their voodoo, uh, their animistic religion, right? There's a cliff dwelling lodged into the cliff face. In the foreground, however, is where contemporary settlement. Uh, up until a few years ago, these were inhabited. So not long ago, but now settlement has been preferential toward the low flatlands. Once again, probably an effect of globalization, or at least of modernization. At least down here, there's a road, not much of a road, but it's a, it's a dirt track, right? Which vehicles can make at least four-wheel drives and motorbikes can make their way across, as opposed to they realize there's no longer need, any need Right, no imminent enemies to have to be up here in the cliffs. Right, so now they'd prefer to live, you know. Um, nonetheless, still in relatively traditional dwellings, they're all completely, you know, entirely mud-walled uh, dwellings with flat roofs. The roof often used, the terrace is used for certain purposes. The mosque, right? Islam has definitely pervaded and been there for many years. Uh, the thatched dwellings. If a dwelling is thatched, in this case, it's almost always a granary. And these are the granaries that are part of the housing compound. Um, some of the bigger granaries are, don't necessarily have a thatched roof. Smaller granaries are usually for women. The bigger granaries, uh, were the, as I said, for men, but for the whole family, right? Yeah. A question, if I may. OK. Uh, who builds those houses? Because when the I think people themselves, the, the locals. The people who live, who are going to live in them, or professionals? Or? Well, no, yeah, the, lo the people who are going to live in them. The family, the family members do. Yeah, there are some more granaries, right? In this case, flat, you know, just the flat mud roof. Uh, the two-level granaries are usually for men, you know, for the whole family. In the one, the smaller ones are for you know the women. That's for themselves, right? Um, because of the men providing for animals. Or well, the men are providing for, for the whole family, and this is you know the you know the men, are, the women aren't allowed to get anywhere to even lay a finger on the, on the males on on the uh, I mean the women aren't allowed to lay a finger on the male on the men's granaries, and supposedly the men aren't allowed to touch the female granaries either. There's definitely these are definitely like most of them are definitely patriarchal societies, and I guess what we consider very even ways oppressive toward the women. Yeah. Could you, could you speak for a minute about like, what generates sex-segregated food storage? Is that religious? Is it taboo? What? So, okay, well, I, well I, 
I, I sort of presented the question this way to my guide. You know why? You know why? Um, you know why is it so segregated by sexes? Why can't you know why can't the women or the children go near the men's granaries or supposedly vice versa? Or first he said his answer for the, the first part of the question is like, oh no, because if the women were allowed into them, they'd eat it. They'd gobble it all up. They, they, that, that, that's literally the way he put it in French. This is the way he put it to me. They'd come and they'd hog it all up. So if that's not a sexist remark, right? You know, you can't, it's like you can't trust those women, you know. Basically is what, is what he told me, and he wasn't the only guide. You know, I asked a guy in another, in a non-Dogon village, complete, further down the road there, and Molly gave me the same answer, right? Yes? I presume if they segregated granaries, that means that the men have to do their own cooking. Ha, 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 No, I, I hate, I mean, I hate to say, um, if there's... Right. Out yeah. The woman, and well, she's got it. I mean, <laughs> exactly. And of course, there are was like, well, the, the women get to have their little granaries so they can have extra for themselves. The men, the, 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 the men said, we keep that under lock and key so we can provide for the whole family. That that was once again that was the argument, right? Of course, I put perhaps you know I could. There's not enough time to go on forever about every little thing because there's so many different uh, dynamics of each of these cultures, right? But yeah, you know, well, I I present even more sensitive question to my guide, and of course, some of you probably can already imagine what that has to deal with that's quite common in West Africa. And I unfortunately found out that it's common here, and that's in regard to uh, uh, female circumcision. And he said, oh yes, and I was afraid he was, I was afraid he was gonna lie to me just to tell me what I wanted to hear. As a way, knowing I'm a, I'm a Westerner, you know, would have the typical Western mindset, you know, I asked him, so does this really, can you, be honest, can you tell, is this really going? He said, yeah, I'm afraid. I have to. T I have to admit, yes, it does. Um, you know, he almost act like sort of unfortunately. And he says, maybe, hopefully, within 50 years, things will change. In another 50 years, right? Things might change. That was his answer. So, uh, yeah, def definitely. Um, male in, in my own personal observation in terms of work, and even even as one of the museums in Benin portrayed, the woman in Africa does everything. The man does, not, or does maybe next to nothing, right? Man tends, men tend to the animals, men and boys tend to the animals, uh, give out rules, give out orders, run the political system. Women, you know, raise, bear, raise, bear and raise kids, right? Cook, clean, raise the crops, right? You know, plant and harvest the crops and do just about everything else. Uh, this is a totem here. This is what they call a totem. This is actually the, the animistic place of worship. So lizards and snakes definitely are important uh, figures in, their, in terms of their deities and what their spiritual deities, right, and the animistic. So here you have animism combined with Islam, and in some, some cases Christianity as well. This is actually one of the housing compounds. Is actually, this is Hasimi's, this is where his family lived, supposedly, the extended family compound, and quite a decorative entranceway going into the compound. There's a little... Uh, <coughs> shelter there where the family hangs out during the day. Yeah, and I will admit, who do you usually see hanging out in the shade, whether it be beside a mosque or in the houses or elsewhere during the heat of the day? The men, right? While the women are pounding away at the millet, right? Grinding it into meal or cooking or, you know, whatnot. Uh, there's looking into the compound with the granaries, the goat. Uh, this is what they call a togu na. This is essentially, as even the, my guide proudly told me, here we have no need for police, no need for courts, no need for judges, no need for the state in general. Here we can resolve all problems on our own. All we have, all we need is a chief and the, and the tribal elders and everything's so peaceful and quaint and quite, you know, kind of, kind of portrayed it, you know, in a sort of a near perfect uh, point, you know, uh, point of view. But um, anyhow, this is where the tribal elders, this is kind of what he called the closest thing to a courtroom. Anywhere it serves, is any, serves anything from a courtroom to a city hall, right, is the togu knots. It's, they're usually no, I mean, you usually have to duck to get into them and kind of crawl, right? They're only about yay high. But when I saw there were mostly tribal elders and just other men folk laying around and taking it easy, lounging around during the heat of the day is, you know, I guess what it's used for as well. Uh, supposedly women and children aren't, aren't allowed, or at least girls aren't allowed into them. Um, interestingly, their roof, the thatch for the roof is made up of, um, those are actually uh, millet stalks after the millet's been, been, you know, harvested and dried. That's, it's about yay, several feet, several feet thick, 
they use for the roofing material on these, on these uh, structures, right? So that's sort of the tribal meeting place, so to speak. Here's another one up on the settlements, either in the cliff or now more recently at the base on the flatland of the escarpment, or also on top of the escarpment. This, these are some of the settlements up on here in Duluth on top of the escarpment. And there's the local Toguna there, right? Uh, people lounging around under it. There's one of your granaries over here. Um, there, of course, is the village right next to that up on top of Jigibombo. Uh, really colorful how it's just built into the landscape, right? Um, and of course, you know, this is, of course, numerously popular among numerous scholars of, you know, architecture, especially of traditional vernacular architecture. I mean, it's hard, to, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to argue with the fact that it's definitely more pleasant on the eye to look at, that it blends in with the landscape, right? Let's say, compared to a mobile home, right? <laughs> <laughs> or even just a concrete, just a concrete box with a tin roof, right? Um, and admittedly, it's going gonna, it's gonna to do a lot more in uh, conducting, or in terms of keeping the dwelling relatively cool during the daytime in this hot climate, right? Or maybe even comfortably warm when it does get chilly in the wintertime. Um, stone, of course, becomes a more prevalent building material as well. What do you think we have up here under the rocks? A naturally formed toguna, mm -hmm. right? Here you have just the, the, the layers of the rock formations, you know, uh, the way they're formed actually, uh, uh, where, where are they? I believe, they, I believe it was sandstone, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and it, the, where the strata line perfectly formed a, you know, a convenient place to have a toguna there. So there the men are lounging around underneath it, up above the village, right? Matter of fact, that's where the village, you know, that's looking down from where that is. Um, this is another, what they call a sort of a totem, right? Sort of a sacred, it looks like a granary, but of course it has all this basically uh, millet porridge that's, that, you know, is, uh, is poured over these sacred, sacred stones or these sacred totems, right, as an offering, as an offering to their gods, right? Of course, they also sacrifice animals as offerings as well. Uh, you were there before the monsoon. How much maintenance would they have after the monsoon season, you know, to get that village back to where? Evidently quite a bit. Evident because I mean, you just look at the quality of the mud walls. It looks like it's been and oh, and somebody asked me a while ago. It made me think of who who does at least if not the building, the maintenance, or even the building of all these uh, and the especially the plaster work and whatnot of these of these structures. Uh, the women and children. That's kind of their. That's kind of when they put the kids. I guess to make the kids useful, where they can kind of enjoy doing it at the same time. And we'll see in a minute here what they've done in Ghana. Um, well, tourism has arrived, so can, can we not argue to some extent, even though it's on a very low scale, uh, has, has globalization not arrived to the very remo as remote as, is, as it is, the Dogon country? So, of course, people who look at, the, at these issues might question, some geographers might question, what's to come along in 10 years from now? Let's say the economy is such that still tourism is still affordable by any major set of the population. Well, in other words, will, will, will something akin to a club med or at least higher standard of accommodations uh, be put in place some years down the road, right? Um, but there it is, but there it is, um, uh, the Ogon, right? The uh, Ogon, you know, of course, named after the what the name for the, the tribal shaman is. Uh, these, each of these, every village, practically every village, nine out of 10 have a little, what they call a campement, which is a very uh, rudimentary form of accommodation for tourists, right? Uh, and that was my sleeping quarters on top of that little mud-walled row of rooms there. It was much more comfortable to sleep up there under the mosquito net at night than it was inside one of those little hot box rooms. Um, historically famous, the Great Mosque of Janae, entirely made of mud and covered. And that, this, this is definitely, about every 10 years or so, it, it's completely refaced, the mud plaster is. Uh, and that's what they call that typical Sudanese style, which diffused from Sudan, well, well, northern Africa, all the way down into, well, as far south as into Ghana, right? Um, so one can, you know, see how the whole thing is, you know, what we call, you know, all the, the great works of, of architecture and mud. So there are definitely lots of qualities to using mud, right? Not only the decorative, the aesthetic qualities of it, but just the, the nature of its, even its preservability in dry climates, such as this one here, definitely proves to be a, a readily available resource and a sustainable resource. Of course, your typical court form layout, right, especially common in, well, all throughout Africa and other places when we're looking at 
mud wall dwellings. We're looking at around, you know, rectangular dwellings around, you know, square rectangular courtyards. Uh, this is in Janae, okay. Um, influences from further north through trade, once again, uh, and Islamic influences from Morocco, right? Morocco and all the little nail heads there on the, on the doors and the windows. That's purely Morocco, and that's also what you'd see in Timbuktu. Um, same thing there, right? Interestingly enough, to look at how much the culture or how much the built environment at least has not changed in this particular town, compare this today to this picture that was taken. Uh, where's the date there? Uh, well, there is no date. Taken back in the, in the late 1800s, sometime in the mid to late 1800s, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, late 1800s, I guess, uh, is when this picture was late 1800s, early 19, beginning of the 1900s, if I'm not mistaken. Hardly any change at all whatsoever, right? Are those multi-story? <laughs> Two-story, yeah. There'd be a second level, second level there, right? Just like we'd see here. There, there are the mud bricks ready for construction, right? Uh, the court form dwelling, right? You go through the main doorway and there's the open courtyard. Um, so other villages around it, once again, that same Sudanese style of mud mosque, the little low, uh, the mud walled houses around it, all in the form of compounds, one connected to the other. See there, more mud bricks, all right? Um, this is actually the local chief that I had the uh, privilege of meeting in this particular village that lies just outside of Janae there, and that's his dwelling on the right, um, around the open courtyard, right? Uh, more, more granaries, right? As you can tell in this case, bullhorns are a symbolic, uh, play a symbolic function there. There's the horn of a bull that's planted into each of the sides of the wall there. Uh, and this, where are the building material? I mean, right there. This is actually an ephemeral swamp. During the rainy season, it fill, this all fills up with water. But during the dry season, you have all this free building material, right? Loads of it in which they quarry and they make into mud bricks. And there you go, right? Plenty of building material. Um, once again, the, the, the Niger is the lifeblood of this part of the world, uh, going upriver to Segu, right? And a very historic, I guess, going back to well over five, six hundred years, there's the main mosques, mosques there, all built out of mud. Um, another one there, of course, somebody, I'm, I've noticed nobody's asked yet what the poles sticking out of the mosques are for. Supposedly, so you could climb up, they can climb up and constantly main, after the, like you say, after the, uh, rainy season so they can uh, climb up those poles, as you see here, and replaster it more easily, right, to do maintenance work. Um, there, of course, you have, this is actually the palace of the local chief in this village. Uh, that's one, one, once again, one of the court form dwellings. Going down into the woodland savanna just a little bit, that style, at least in terms of mosque architecture, persists, even though we're getting into a little bit more humid climate. This is, a, as a matter of fact, this is in, uh, this is in Bobo Giulasso. Jacqueline might be familiar with that. Might have been there, the main mosque. Going out to the hinterlands, once again, there's your typical woodland savanna environment. Your dwellings, this is actually a, out, on the outskirts of Bonfor was this extended family compound there, right, with, with granaries and houses. In this case, mostly all of thatch. What are these? Those of you who like to put shea butter uh, on your skin, right? In other words, hand cream, right? This is where a lot of it when it says shea butter, that's where, that's the raw material. And that's what many of these local villages thrive off of, um, right? And then moving into Ghana there, actually in the northern part of Ghana, more thatched roof, right? More, more gabled or pitched roofs. Interestingly here, this is what children do in their spare time. In, in terms of decorating, maintaining and decorating the plaster work, right? This is the local village chief, and this is actually a chicken coop. He's explaining this, the uh, spiritual function of it, which is quite complex. More shea beans all scattered out in the courtyard of the house, right? Um, and once again, flat, interestingly enough, in such a humid climate, at least with a, with a wet, with a notable wet season, flat roofs are still popular for some people. Once again, they say it's a good place to be able to, when you want to get out of the heat at night, you want to sleep under the open sky, right? This is the most typical form of ladder all throughout, that I saw all throughout West Africa. Making notches into a log, right? Saw that all over West Africa. Um, more your, with your ornately decorated plaster. 
and as we get toward the end here, getting more, um, when you get into towns, once again, the, the, the same layout for the, you know, the, 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 the big housing compound around a courtyard persists, but building materials change a little bit, as you can see. Even in Ghana there, there you have that Sudanese style once again. Even the local chief in this particular village, the Wana, as he calls, still lives in that uh, mud-walled palace. And then going down to the coast, you know, wooded rainforest environment, you can see the building materials, definitely. Uh, of course, here, everything thrives around the cacao or chocolate industry. So there's cacao beans being dried out, ready for export. Interestingly enough, how mud brick still persists in construction, but of course, roofs of, are of tin, right, which are much easier to maintain in a humid climate than thatch. Um, right, this is, in, this is in Togo, up in the highlands there. Um, some stilt dwellings down in the swamps, or yeah, in the, in the, in the marsh, in the wetland areas. This is actually Benin, and fishing, of course, is their main industry there. Finally, just last thing, in terms of sustainable ecological dwellings, this was in Senegal, jumping over there. I found these really interesting with what are called impluvium dwellings, and there's some work been done about them, especially by French researchers. Impluvium means this big extended family house is built in a circle around a courtyard, in which the water, the roof is on, will rain down in the courtyard. This will catch the water. Number one, it will act as a cooling effect via the courtyard to the rest of the house. And number two, as you can see, they perhaps even use it for maybe you know for watering their crops and whatnot, growing things in the courtyard, right? So uh, quite interesting. However, these two dwellings that I visit actually have been built once again for tourists as tourist camps. So you know, tourism is making its inroads. Uh, this is in Guinea-Bissau, Guinea where hipped, in other words, foreshed uh, roofs are common on the traditional dwellings there. Some of thatch, some of tin, right? And I did make it there into Guinea-Bissau, which is to the south of uh, Senegal, town of Arella, and right there on the coast, the coastal, you know, the beach, right there on the beach, the little round huts, right, become common there. And let's see, just to wrap up, since I believe we're out of time. Uh, I ended my trip in Ghana, basically, uh, where you had, once again, the slave trade, right? Where, especially beginning with the Dutch and then the British engaged in the slave trade. Uh, a major point of export of slaves was from this, from the Cape Coast, along, other, along with other uh, forts or castles right along the coast there in Ghana. Um, and of course, that was quite a, as you can imagine, quite a grim place to have to visit. But it all began with the Portuguese, who, this is what they call the Monument of No Return, built by UNESCO there in Benin, where the Portuguese were, the, were one of the first places they engaged in the slave trade in West Africa. And then, of course, I wrap it up with my last day in Ghana is actually where I purchased what I'm wearing here, right? And yeah, bought from a mall, but suppose, would, we, would we not call it maybe an element of popular culture where folk culture is being, the motifs of folk culture um, are being celebrated, so to speak. So anyhow, for whatever it's worth, you know, uh, just about the one and only real, something close to an American style mall in West Africa. There it is in the Ghanaian cop capital of Accra. But as we can see, that's, these sites are relatively rare, right? Um, so anyhow, mm. um, that's the conclusion of it. Just a